now we get to the next talk, right? Yeah, and it's from Michael Löw, and it's about scaling news for large corporations, a topic many of us have made, uh, yeah, have to think about in our daily business. And yeah, without much further ado, here's Michael Löw with his talk about scaling news for large corporations. Please welcome him. <laughs> this is not working. <laughs> I'm having some trouble with my presenter, but um, I think we can just manage. I'm just going to have helping hands advancing the slides, if that's fine with you. Um, yes. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised to see so many people, but that's cool. It's not putting any pressure on me. So, um, Yes, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about um, how we, over the course of the last... 18 months, I think, um, implemented a, um, a NEOS site for, for one of our customers, which I think kind of pushed the boundaries of what is possible to do with, with a CMS. And what we did to, to, um, to accommodate those large scales and what we did to overcome the pitfalls that we, that we ran into. <laughs> Um, this is my agenda. It's not mm, nothing fancy. I'm just going to be talking a little bit about the customer, um, what they're doing, where they come from, what they want. I'm going to be talking about um, some organizational challenges because uh, it just so happened that the start of the project pretty much coincided with the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, which changed the way that we work in a very severe way. Um, the third part is going to be solutions to certain problems. I'm not going to be touching on every problem that we went into, uh, that we ran into over the course of the of the project, because that would probably take the entire weekend. Um, and I'm going to be leaving you with a couple of lessons that we've learned that I want to share with you, just to remind you of those things. Our customer, um, I said. Uh, it's a German um, medical software um, company, uh, Compu Group Medical. They're located in Koblenz and a couple of other countries by this time. Um, a couple of hard facts about the, the customer. They have about uh, 8,000 employees as of now. Um, when we started the project in, uh, in 2020, they only had about 2,500. They grew massively over the last two years, which also uh, exasperated the problems that we had with the, <laughs> with the way we tried to set the project up. They have about 4 to 6 percent year-over-year organic growth, so it's a very healthy company, which is good for us as an agency. Um, they have about a billion euros, or milliarde for the Germans, uh, uh, euros in revenue per year, and they operate it in more than 20 countries across the globe. Uh, Compo Group is driven by a very easy yet very complicated mission. Um, their founder, Frank Gotta, put it in the words, nobody should suffer or die because at some point medical information was missing. This is their whole point of existence. They want to provide medical information, they want to provide um, doctors with medical information, they want to provide patients with medical information. And so all the software that they're developing is aimed at this, this specific key. Um, fortunate for us was that we could start the project with a very, uh, let's call it a greenfield approach. Our customer had an existing website. It was terrible. Um, and we were tasked with creating an entirely new website. There was no... Uh, there were no plans to, to migrate anything. It was just start this new, we had a new layout, we, did, we, we made a new web website and they created all the content from scratch. So that made it a lot easier for us. Um, the site was developed with Neos, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here. Um, the question is why though? Why would a billion euro revenue company choose to go with a weird, quirky, sort of central European open source content management system? And the answer to that is pretty easy. Um, it wasn't our fault. It's actually, there's three guys in the front row there to my right. Great guys, by the way. They went ahead and they did a proof of concept with the, with the customer. They developed a brand portal where they 
store their brand assets, where they store their logos and everything, where you can register and download the stuff. And they did that with Neos. And the customer loved it. And so it was pretty clear that we uh, were going to go ahead and develop the, the actual website with, with Neos, which was nice for us because we know how to do that. And that's how we came into play, because we're good at what we're doing. <laughs> Another part was that uh, the customer, I'm going to be abbreviating them as CGM, and uh, every time you see that, what I'm talking about is Compu Group Medical. It's just a very unwieldy name. Since they're a medical company, they have a very, very high demand for data privacy. Um, they, try, they enforce that throughout all their software, and they were also very, very strict in regards to their website. And for this reason, it was very, very near to them to, to go with an open source solution because they could actually check what was going on. They could see the code, they could see the implementations, and there was no black boxes that they could not handle in any way. So it was, it was, it was very good for them to know that they could, in theory, check what we're doing, and they could also move to a different agency. This is another um, point that's very important to them. But we also, we, we didn't stop there. Every single part of software that we used in that, in that project was actually open source. We added a lot of different systems on top, like a, a ticketing system, a shop system. Everything was open source from the ground up. And we're actually very proud of that. Organizational challenges. I mean, this is probably nothing stranger to most of you. There is always going to be organizational challenges, but I'm pretty sure that this was rather exceptional in the way that it was not only us as Punkti, as an agency that worked on the project, but we actually pooled knowledge and we pooled resources from a lot of different parties. You've met one of the parties. <laughs> um, we actually worked together with five different agencies and across six teams across those agencies. And there were times where about 20 devs and designers were working in tandem at the same time on that project. That was too fast. We try to accommodate that by, um, by working in two-week uh, iterations. Uh, some would call it Scrum. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I'm not entirely sure. But we try to Scrumify the entire process. Uh, now you can advance. <laughs> uh, the project was run in, the, in this configuration. Project lead and technical lead was done by, on the one hand, actually our customer's IT department. On the other hand, Punkt.de. We um, combined development resources from Kaufmann Digital and from us, Punkt.de. We had uh, an agency tasked with design strategy and UX that's uh, made in. We've worked with them on a lot of projects. They're from Frankfurt. They're great guys. Um, and SEO and marketing, or marketing planning, let's call it that way, was done by WebNets. A big challenge was to actually coordinate tasks and responsibilities, because you, you can imagine if there's five agencies, everyone is working at the same time, how do you make sure that everyone is staying in sync, that not two agencies are working on the same problem, coming up with different solutions, and then you have two solutions that do the same thing, and you don't know what to choose. So we came up with, a, with an organizational structure where we actually had daily events in all the teams, um, we had daily events with the customer, um, where at least part of our team was uh, in contact with the customer every single morning, trying to coordinate what was supposed to be done in that day. So we had teeny tiny little one day sprints, if you want to call them. So we, we actually coordinated for, the, for that same day what was supposed to be done. And we also had uh, <laughs> sometimes productive, sometimes just funny weekly meetings with, with all the agencies that were participati uh, participating in that, in that project. And that was our way of trying to stay in sync, because that was very important for us. Um, we managed our code in a, in a dedicated GitLab instance that was run on our customers' infrastructure that was very important to them, that actually all the code that was developed stayed on their servers. We couldn't use our own, because they wanted total control over what we're doing. Those numbers are from yesterday. I'm not sure where we're at right now, but we had about 8,000 commits to main branch uh, in the last 18 months and about 14,000, 15,000 pipelines with about 100,000 jobs that have been run in the past 18 months. So there was actually a lot of traffic in the, in the GitLab instance and a lot of fast and, and, and recurrent um, integration jobs that, that have been done. 
We tracked our issues through our own Jira. That was okay because no one wanted to pay for another Jira instance. Um, this is from yesterday. It was about 4,600 issues that have been opened over the course of the project. Fun fact, budget was not an issue. I know this might sound surprising to a lot of you who've probably never experienced that. It's, it's very interesting to work in a project where money is not a problem. However, we had a big issue with the time available because for the, for the initial launch of the new website, we were given six months starting in July 2020. And in December 2020, the site was supposed to go live. Um, we tried to alleviate this time concern by actually working together with a lot of agencies, and it, we, actually, we, we succeeded in going live in January 21. So we almost met the deadline. Um, and yes, that's it. Sorry. <laughs> it's kind of weird to communicate with the slides. As I said initially, something happened at the beginning of 2020 that m made us rethink the way we work. We're a very, let's call it, personal, close working agency, and we're used to actually starting our projects by going to our customer, having a workshop or two with them, trying to come up with, uh, actually, that's the next slide, but whatever. Um, we start out with very, very long initial workshops where we try to find out what our customer actually needs, not what they want, but what they need. There's a very big difference between those two things, as you might know. Um, it, it turned out that it, this actually works perfectly in the digital space. We relied on uh, Miro, which is like a whiteboard tool thingy. And it turns out that if you just write down everything, you actually have everything written down. It's mind-blowing, but we actually we profited from the way we worked there. It was a, it was a long workshop. We spent, I think, three and a half days in a Zoom call. Um, but we came up with a set of demands and a set of wishes that we could just take, put them into a JIRA, and start working on the stuff. So this actually helped us in a, in a great way we, we, we didn't think was possible in that way. Another challenge was... Um, how do you get people on board if no one is in the same room? Like, you get, a new, you get a new dev, you get a new designer, and people have been working for months on that project. How do you get someone up to speed without ever meeting them? And as I said, the, the time frame was very short, so we, we started adding people and adding people and adding people to meet the deadline, and it was very difficult to, um, to get people on board and try to understand what the project was about, what the goals were. And we came up with a way of having very, very frequent video calls, as probably everyone did in that time, and relied on screen sharing a lot and trying to explain to people during video calls how, how stuff works. And it turned out it, was, it, it worked pretty well because we agreed on, on coding guidelines beforehand. I'm going to be coming back to that in a little bit. But that helped us a great deal. Next organizational challenges, I touched on that before. Data privacy in the medical field is very important. Our customer is very adamant about data privacy. They're used to being very data sensitive in, in all the applications that they use, that they write. And they were sensible in the same way with their website. And so they monitored us closely, and they monitored the things we did in terms of how does this affect data privacy. And we were in close contact with them and in constant contact with them about how to implement features in a way that doesn't disrupt users' data privacy. The solution we came up is just, uh, it's a website. I'm going to spoil that right now. Um, it has about 200,000 plus nodes, I think. Um, it's consistent of 11 NEOS sites. Each of the sites has ranging from like 5 to 27 different languages. Um, we have about 220 editor accounts that are working on the page daily, and our infrastructure is hit with about 250,000 requests every day, which is actually not that terrible considering there's sites that get a lot more traffic, but it was for us, it was a lot. That's most of our tech stack that we used. Um, some of them are communications, uh, some of them are organiza organization, some of them are just technical tools that we use. But I, I, I'm not going to touch onto all of them, but that's most of the stuff that we used. 
The first solution that I want to talk about is um, because, as I said before, it helped us a great deal, was actually defining, and this was before we even started developing, was defining coding guidelines for every language that we used. We have a, um, we have a confluence section where we define coding guidelines for all the languages that we run, with um, examples, with structures, with ways how to write comments. And this might seem very nitpicky, but it's absolutely necessary if you're running a project across teams where you onboard and offboard people regularly. You need to have strict coding guidelines to ensure that everyone else can actually read other people's code and that everyone else can review other people's code. Because if you, if you start to branch out in your coding styles, you, you lose that, that grasp on the entire project. So it's very important to define those. Next solution concerning data privacy. No customer data leaves our servers or our infrastructure without careful consideration. It's very important to us. It was very important to our customers. And one of the ways we did that was, uh, for example, not using Google Analytics, because we were not able to, to ensure that our data was stored in a, in a data sensitive way. We could not ensure that Google does not leak our customers' data onto other platforms. And that's why we came up with, a, um, with our self-hosted Matomo instance. And I don't know if any one of you has ever worked with Matomo. So you might raise your hands. Do you like it? We did at first. <laughs> it turns out Matomo does not really scale that well, which is why we um, went ahead and added uh, a, another layer to that, um, to that tool, because while Matomo is very powerful in the way it gathers data, and then it, like, it, it has a newer data layer implementation that pretty much mimics the, uh, mimics the things Google Analytics does, but it's very slow in, in generating reports. Um, we have, like, we have a, like a, a, a messaging system when one of, the, one of the nodes in our cluster breaks down, it was ringing constantly because someone was triggering random reports in the Matomo backend, and I needed to get up in the middle of the night and kill a bunch of servers to make sure that it, the entire infrastructure, uh, infrastructure was back up running. We finally somewhat alleviated that pressure by adding that Kibana instance. But please, if anyone knows of a better way to do that, please, please send help. I'm very frustrated with that. We, we did not come up with, like, a solution that we liked and that our customer liked without breaking, um, without breaking boundaries of certain systems. So we did not find a way to do that. And that's why we came up with this way of having Matomo and Kibana in tandem. Kibana generating the reports and Matomo gathering the data and providing the data layer. Another thing we did, and this is, that was, is really funny to me because I never thought about that. But, I mean, we all know that you should not have Google Maps on your website, right? It's very bad. It passes a lot of customer data to Google. Did you know that OpenStreetMap also does that? They also do that. OK, some of you are nodding. That's fine. I, I did not know that. But actually, OpenStreetMap gathers a lot of data of your customers. Um, but other than, um, um, in a way that Google Maps does not let you do that, you can actually proxy requests to OpenStreetMap through a server and strip all the customer data out from the request and just get, for example, the, the maps that you need. There's other ways to do that. You could run your own dedicated tile server for OpenStreetMap, but this was actually the easiest way for us to do. We just take the request, we strip all the data from it, just get the map, and parse it back to our customers. The next thing we do, and I might, I'm pretty sure this is going to be highly debatable, because um, for, for a website of that size, it, it feels unnatural to run on just dedicated hardware to just run in your own infrastructure, run in your own um, data center. But it was important to our customer. Um, they wanted to make sure that no data leaves their data center, and so we're running on their hardware in their data centers. Um, we, have, we have two data centers running about 50 machines at all time. Everything is mirrored. Most of the systems are actually mirrored in redundancy. So we have a large infrastructure running most of that, uh, pretty much everything, all of that is automated. None of it is done with Kubernetes. I know there was a guy here talking about Kubernetes. I don't have any clue how that works. But um, that's part of the net plan. 
a, a couple of different virtual private networks, a couple of different DMZs just running in tandem with several load balancers and cloud for TLS termination. I'm not a techie. Um, we run our CI or CD pipelines with, uh, with Hetzner Cloud because, once again, we wanted to have our data not in a random US-based data center. We just wanted to run on European infrastructure that adheres to European data privacy laws. Funnily enough, one of the biggest challenges <laughs> was actually um, clustering uh, databases, clustering Redis, clustering Elasticsearch with only two data centers. We didn't know this beforehand, but it's a really stupid idea just to have two data centers. If you can, always get three. Because have you tried reaching Quorum with just two people? Probably not going to work very nice if people are not agreeing. So you need three nodes or five nodes or seven nodes if you can afford them. But we, we realized that pretty late into the development, and so we only had two data centers, which is why we started faking out third nodes in one of the data centers, just trying to figure out a quorum for our uh, distributed database service. This is actually probably the biggest, the, the biggest issue that we have. NEOS is really, really good in providing multi-site instances. You all know that it's super easy to run multi-site uh, instances of NEOS. You can have different node trees. You can have different assets put into certain collections. You can have, well, you, you must have different site packages to, to bring your own fusion rendering and everything. And even the basic role concept that NEOS provides is totally fine for that, for that idea. But, A bad bridge. Neos actually lacks um, lacks a good way of um, controlling access and controlling configuration across sites. You cannot differentiate node types through different sites. You always have your node types are always public. They're all available to all sites, so every backend editor can just use every node type that you want. You cannot have certain node types in a certain site, since node types are only configuration. Same goes for all the configuration. You cannot, ha you cannot separate out different configuration for different sites. That was a big problem for us. There's no high-level API to restrict editors to certain sites. There's no high-level API to restrict certain asset collections to different sites. And most of all, we, we rely a lot on, on, on modules that other agencies provide or other people provide. That's part of why we're running open source software. But most of those are not built with that scale in mind. And so you end up having modules that do not provide you with an easy way to restrict the records that they create. We tried, we tried, we tried, we tried to figure out a way to make it work and gave up. It didn't work. We, we could not get the separation of data that we wanted, but we came up with a different solution. Um, the way we set up the project was actually we were running the same code but in different contexts. So but what we're basically doing is, I'm going, to call, I'm going to be calling them tenants from now on, because they're not just sites, they're tenants. They're in part, they're actually different companies that are working with the same layouts that we provide, but it's, it, it's separate companies for the most part. And so we came up with a way to differentiate those tenants by contexts. So we're actually providing instances with a certain context, and by that context, they load configuration. Um, this is through, um, it, it's, it's basically done through environment configurations that we deploy to the servers. Every tenant uses its own database, so we need to provide credentials, which we do through environment va variables. Um, every tenant uses its own S3 bucket for asset storage. By the way, this is not AWS S3. We're actually running MinIO for local um, S3 storage, it works with the same API. It's just it's on your own infrastructure, which was important to our customer. So we have uh, separate buckets for every instance. That was too fast. Um, <laughs> which allows us to configure access to that bucket easily for all the instances. We also run our own um, Elastic Index prefix for all, uh, for all customers. Actually, this is all done in one instance, but since there have been certain advances in the, in the Flowpack packages regarding Elasticsearch. Um, 
we can actually do that. We run a dedicated Elasticsearch index uh, instance, actually distributed across three machines, one for Quorum, but they're separated by, by indices. And we actually put those things back into the, into the packages. Um, Daniel, who was supposed to be here with me, did a lot of work on that, and that enabled us to run certain separated Elastic parts in the same instance. So now we have a bunch of different contexts, a bunch of different sites that are all running in separate instances, running on different databases, but with the same Elastic Index. How the hell do you get that under control? We try to, we try to simplify it, especially for our backend editors, because we have certain editors that are actually allowed to work on different sites. And that's why we started out with um, making sure that no editor needs to worry about being logged in or not. So we, we, have, a, we have a rather hefty uh, OpenID Connect instance that also, uh, it's for once, it's, um, it's powered by Keycloak, where you can just have certain users. We have our agency's Keycloak. We have the uh, MS365 instance of our customer. And they're all coming together into that one Keycloak instance that provides OIDC access for all the editors. That was, that was a very interesting thing. Um, if, you, if you run a flow command on, on, the, on the CLI, which of those instances do you now target? Because they're basically running in the same infrastructure and you want to control them all. How do you, how do you make sure that you target the specific instance? And uh, for that, we came up with a wrapper script that actually differentiates the context, offers you a, um, a list of co available contexts, and gives you the chance to just, for example, flush caches of one instance. You you run your regular flow commands, and it asks you, do you want to, in that case, I don't know, run the main instance, or do you want to change telematic infrastructure? And you just type in that, and it runs the command for that instance in that context. Another thing that we came up with was actually enabling backend editors to switch between sites, even though they were in different instances. So our application knows about all the context, so it can actually redirect you to a different site that's actually hosted in a different context. This still respects th all the sites that you're allowed to view. And so a backend editor can actually just choose between the site that they want to access and, um, and, and access that. Wow, that was a great sentence. Um, right. Thematic cut. Um, we also did some rather advanced um, rendering for newsletters that was an important um, topic for our customers. And we integrated um, newsletter rendering into the Neos backend with, um, for one's specific note types that are able to output a, um, a MGML templated newsletter definition or a, a email definition. Um, we also implemented a, a specific preview mode where you can actually see the way a newsletter is going to be rendered in an email client or most of the email clients, please do not talk to me about Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Outlook. I hate it. I hate it with a fiery passion. But um, what we also did was integrate this newsletter delivery into um, the Neos UI. So we provide our, um, our editors with a way to schedule delivery of newsletters, which then communicates via API to the newsletter tool. Um, it also allows you to send test mailings. It gives you feedback on what is missing. I don't know if you can read that, but it gives you feedback at what, about what, what parts of the newsletter are missing so that it can actually be scheduled, and we don't allow you to schedule that newsletter until it is complete. And we also connected those newsletter documents to, um, uh, to Avalanche. That's a, it's a German um, product that does newsletter delivery. It's basically MailChimp, but with European data privacy laws. And we also connected it to our customers' um, SAP Marketing Cloud hosting service. How do you keep 220 backend editors under control? They're going to be doing a lot of things. They're going to be doing a lot of things at the same time. How do you prevent them from messing up everything? Um, we added a, um, a module to the, to the UI. Actually, this is in the same place as the newsletter is. We trained our editors to look there for stuff that might be wrong. Um, this module actually, every time you load a new document node in the back end, it checks if someone else has done changes in that page. And if so, 
it provides you with this handy indicator that says this page has changes in other workspaces. Click here for more information. And then you can see a list of uh, who has done what, when, why, no, not why, but you can actually see who has done changes into what element. And the idea is that you can then go and, as of now, talk to the person and make sure that those changes are correct, have them publish those changes so that you can actually make another change. Um, oh my god, I cannot touch that. Um, we have open source this package. This is available on our GitHub page. You can just drop it in. Um, there's no, I think, I don't think there's any other changes that need to be made. You just drop it in and then you have that protection layer onto changes that your backend editors have made. This also ensured that we have a seamless and traceable way of proving what has been changed because since our customer is a listed company, they need to have a dedicated log of everything that has been changed on our website because otherwise they could be um, liable for uh, stock fraud, for example, because they could say, no, we did not publish that, and they have published certain news and then redacted them, and then their stock price changed. And so have, working with a listed company actually comes with its own set of complications that you need to be aware of. This is one of them. The next part, this is again about data privacy, is how to connect the SAP Marketing Cloud in a, I'm going to call it data privacy conscious way, because there is no way to connect any marketing tool without actually passing some sort of, uh, of user data. And let's face it, corporate websites need user data. They cannot operate without them, because otherwise, if, if they don't, generate a certain amount of user data, they're just going to be providing stale or dead information that no one wants to read. They need to figure out how to reach their customers. They need to actually be able to get in touch with their customers. So they need to be able to, I don't know, send them emails or remind them about things. And uh, for that matter, we actually employed, uh, which was pretty handy because they've been working on this project for any <laughs> anyway, uh, was uh, Kaufman Digital's cookie management um, packages. I can only recommend those again and again. And we used those, and we, um, we made sure that no user data was just randomly passed, but everything was done through forms where user actually had to acknowledge that they're sending data. So we did not just pass random data. Um, another thing, and that was a pretty interesting topic, is um, usually you, um, you start a website, and then you start adding translations in some way, and you start translating whatever module you have in the back end, or you start translating placeholders and everything. And at some point into the project, someone comes, oh, yeah, we have that one guy from Croatia. Can you please provide translations? What I would say then is no, because I do not speak Croatian. What we did do, however, was uh, in order to accommodate those, uh, it, it says 14 languages, I think it's 14 languages in a couple of countries, um, was we set up a dedicated WebLate um, instance, um, which was also secured by our OpenID Connect. And in case you don't know WebLate, what it actually does is it, it's a tool that indexes um, XML language files and provides you with a very seamless UI to, um, to translate those. You can have editor accounts as well, and those editors are able to, to translate stuff that uh, is needed t uh, in the back end. And the great thing is that um, we connected that WebLate instance to our GitLab, so every time an editor actually made a change, we were given a, a pull request or a merge request in, in, in GitLab's case. And those can just be approved by integrators and automatically deployed to all the instances. What this does is that it takes away the... No. What this does is it, it takes away the... Um, the hassle of trying to come up with your own translations and offloads these tasks to people who are actually able to do those because they have the, the, the knowledge and the business logic of your customer who are able to speak the language. Which, uh, it's a great plus, actually. But it also gives you control as an integrator to make sure that no changes go into your code unwanted. I'm just going to make weird gestures every time. What are the things that we took home after this project or during this project? It is still ongoing. The first lesson is synchronize. You need to have every participating party 
in a position where they know what is going on. You cannot just run into one direction and hope that everyone else just follows your lead. You need to synchronize. You need to constantly update everyone that is involved in the project. The next point is, and this goes towards Niels, is uh, multi-site is not multi-tenant. It's not true. Um, we came up with a solution, but bear in mind, just because you have different sites does not mean you have different configurations and different node types. It's very different. This helped us a great deal. I talked about this. Agree on coding guidelines. You need to run the same set of rules against code. Um, the best way would be to actually um, have tools that evaluate the coding guidelines and make sure that code that is pushed into the repository actually applies to those coding guidelines, but that's the next step. Just first step is just agree on something. Agree on a way to write code that is sensible for all parties um, involved. Next one is use an odd number of data centers. Don't do the weird stuff that we did. It's just stupid. And last, and this is uh, rather important and, and very dear to my heart, if you run a project like that, if you run a project in, a, in such a short time frame with so many people, take care of yourself. Make sure that you're well and make sure that your colleagues are well. Because working in, 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 at, at such a high pace and at, at such a high workload takes a big toll on people. And it takes a big toll on everyone involved. It takes a big toll on people on your customer side as well. Just try to ensure that you're, that you're well and that your colleagues are well. And if you're not, try to work against that and try to come up with solutions for that, for that problem because this is going to hurt you in the long run. Second to last slide. Um, since they're sitting there, I'd like to extend a very, very, very big thank you to the guys from Kaufmann Digital because they helped us tremendously in the last 18 months. And I'm very proud to have been working with you. It was a lot of fun, and I, enjoy it. I enjoyed it very much, and I'm looking forward to working with you again. So. I think I've got four minutes left. So if anyone has uh, questions, Feel free to ask them now or just ask me later. That's whatever you want to do. Yes. Excuse me, uh, could you repeat your question, please, through the microphone so um, that he he our remotees okay. can also hear the question? <laughs> the question was if uh, the architecture with the database cluster stretched across two locations was demanded by the customer, and the answer was yes. The answer was That's yes, my, yeah. My recommendation would be not to do that. And we were also only provided with two uh, data center nodes, so we, could not, we, we did not have another chance. Do you want me to, to read those questions? I mean, if you want. Sorry. Please read them. Yeah. The first question, <laughs> is the script for multi-tenancy open source uh, from Sebastian? Not yet. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's a mess right now, <laughs> but we're, um, we're planning on doing that, actually. This act, um, th funnily enough, um, some, of the th uh, some of the things are actually dependent on some stuff that comes with Neos 8. For example, the user switching and everything that is going to be helping us tremendously with open sourcing this stuff. So not yet. It will be. When you use different databases and other services, e.g. S3 for each tenant, why did you not split the whole site in different nodes with own infrastructure? You could have used multiple pipelines in order to deploy same code to each infrastructure. We did not have enough VMs for that. We did not run a Kubernetes instance because no one at our team knew how to do that at that point, and so we chose the way that we were, comf uh, we were comfortable with working and tried to make the best of the situation that we're given. In retrospect, probably we could have changed a lot of things, but it was the way that we started and it was the way that we came up with. So yes, we could have. We didn't. And since you, have to, uh, since you seem to have a very hard time separating different sites within one code base, what was the reason to go with one? Okay, this is the same question. Um, yes. 
once again, we, we have actually, we, we had a certain num number of VMs that we could run in the infrastructure, and that was the way that we came up with it. So, thanks a lot to Mikkel and for his great talk and his great insights into the into scaling news for large corporations. It was a very great talk and very interesting, and many of us can take a lot of things from that with us. Thanks again for doing our job and reading the questions out yourself. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Give a big applause. Thank you.